Right. If you know what's good for you, you do. Okay. We got this. The Serial Garden by Joan Aiken, part two. Mark has discovered that the garden on the back of the cereal packet, the model garden, is magic and he can get into it. And he's also discovered that there are more bits to the garden if you buy more packets. So now he's trying to persuade his dad to give him some money to buy more packets. This isn't for a space gun, is it, said dad. No. Can I have the money now? Hmm. If you mow the lawn, and the lawn will have to be like velvet, and if there's any falling off in the coal supply, I shall demand that money back, said Dad. Oh, there won't be, said Mark. As soon as lunch was over, he dashed down to Miss Pride's. Was there a chance that she would have sections one, two, four, five, and six? He felt certain that no other shop had ever even heard of breakfast bricks, so she was his only hope, apart from this address in Shepherd's Bush. Oh, I don't know, I'm sure, said Miss Pride. Very doubtful, and more than a little surprised. There might just be a couple on the bottom shelf. Yes, here we are. There were sections four and five, bent and dusty, but intact. Don't you suppose you have any more anywhere? I'm looking in the cellar, but I can't promise. Miss, Miss Pride said aggrievedly. She opened a door, revealing a, slight, a flight of damp stone steps. Mark followed it down like a bloodhound on the trail. The cellar was a fearful confusion of milled weed tattered and toppling cartons, some full, some empty. Mark was nearly knocked out cold by a shower of tinned pilchards, which he dislodged. At last Miss Pride, with a cry of triumph, unearthed a little catch of breakfast bricks, three packets which turned out to be the remaining sections, six, one and two. Well, isn't that a piece of luck, she said, looking quite faint with all the excitement. It was indeed rare for Miss Pride to sell as many as five packets of anything at one go. Mark galloped home with his booty and met his father on the porch. Mr Armitage let out a groan. Oh, I wish you'd bought the space gun, he said. Breakfast, brick for supper too. Give peaceful sleep the whole night through. But I don't want a peaceful sleep, said Mr Armitage. I intend to spend tonight mouse watching. During the next few days, Mark's parents watched anxiously to see, Mr Armitage said, whether Mark would start to sprout esparto grass instead of hair for he doggedly ate breakfast bricks for lunch, with soup, sprinkled over his pudding, for tea, with jam, for supper, fried in dripping. Not to mention, of course, the immense helpings he had for breakfast with sugar and milk. Mr Armitage, for his part, soon gave out. He said he couldn't taste another breakfast brick, even if it was wrapped in an inch thick layer of pâté de foie gras. Mark regretted that Harriet, who was a handy and uncritical eater, was still away, convalescing for measles with an aunt. They're always going away because of measles kids in these stories. In two days, the second packet was finished and Mark cut it out and fastened it together and joined it onto section three with trembling hands. Would the spell still work? He sang the rhyme in a quavering voice, but luckily the playroom door was shut and there was no one to hear him. And yes, the gate grew tall again. And when he opened it and ran across the lawn through the yew arch, he found himself in a flagged garden full of flowers like huge blue cabbages. Mark stood hugging himself with satisfaction and then began to wander about smelling the flowers, which had a spicy perfume, most unlike any flower he could think of. Suddenly he pricked up his ears. Had he caught a sound? Yes. It was like there was somebody crying. It seemed to come from beyond the hedge. He ran to the next opening and looked through. Nothing but grey mist and emptiness, but unless he had imagined it, just before he got there, his eyes had caught the flash of white and gold drapery swishing past the gateway. Do you think Mark's all right? Mrs Armitage said. He seems to be in such a dream all the time. Gone clean off his rocker, said Mr Armitage. It's all these doormats he's been eating. Can't be good to stuff your insides with mouldy jute. Still, I'm bound to say he's cut the lawn very well. He seems to remember in the coal. I had better take a day off from the office and drive you over to the shore for a picnic. The sea air will do Mark good. Mrs Armitage suggested to Mark that he should slack off on the breakfast bricks, but he was so horrified at the idea that she abandoned it. But, she said, he was to run four times round the garden every morning before breakfast. Mark said, which garden? Almost, but stopped himself just in time. He had cut out and completed another large lawn, a lake, some weeping willows, and on the far side of the lake, he'd had a tantalising glimpse of a figure dressed in white and gold. 
After munching his way through the fourth packet, he was able to add on a broad grass walk bordered by curious clipped trees, and at the end of the walk, he could see the white and gold person. But when he ran to the spot, no one was there. The walk ended in the usual grey mist. When he had finished and cut out the fifth packet, an orchard, a terrible thing happened. For two days, he could not remember the tune that worked the spell. He tried other tunes, but they were no use. He sat in the playroom singing till his, he was hoarse. Suppose he never remembered it again. His mother shook his head at him that evening. She said he looked as if he needed a dose. It's lucky we're going to Shingle Mud Bay tomorrow. That ought to do you good. Oh, I'd forgotten about that, said Mark. His mother stared at him in astonishment. But in the middle of the night, he remembered the right tune, leapt out of bed in a tremendous hurry, ran to the playroom without even waiting to put on his dressing gown. The orchard was wonderful. For instead of apples, it bore oranges, lemons, limes, and all sorts of tropical fruits whose names he did not know. And there were melons and pineapples growing, plantains and avocados, and better still, the lady in white and gold. She drew near enough to speak to him. Who are you? she asked, very much astonished at the sight of him. Mark Armitage, she said. Is this your garden? Close to, he saw that she was rather grand. Her dress was white satin, embroidered with pearls, and it swept the ground. She had a gold scarf, dressed high and powdered. Her hair, dressed high and powdered, was confined in a little golden pearl tiara. Her face was rather plain pink with a long nose but she had a kind expression and beautiful grey eyes indeed it is she said with hauteur i am princess sophia maria louisa of sax hoffen poffen und hamster what are you doing here well said mark it seemed to come about through singing indeed how interesting did the tune perhaps go like this and she hummed the tune that's it how did you know why, you foolish boy. It was I who put the spell upon the garden to make it come alive when the tune is played. I say, said Mark. Can you do spells as well as being a princess? Naturally. At the court of Saxe, Hoffen, Poppen and Hunster, where I was educated, all princesses were taught magic. Not so much as to be vulgar. Just enough to get out of social difficulties. How useful, said Mark. And now did you work the spell for the garden? Why, you see, the princess was obviously delighted to have someone to talk to. She sat on a stone seat and patted it so that Mark could go and sit next to her. I had the misfortune to fall in love with Herr Rudolf, the court kapellmeister, who taught me music. He was so kind and handsome, and he was most talented. But my father, of course, would not hear of my marrying him because he was common, like you. So what did you do? I arranged to vanish. Rudy had given me a beautiful book with many pictures of gardens. My father kept a strict watch to see that I did not run away. So I used to slip between the pages of the book when I wanted to be alone, and then we decided to marry. I asked my maid to take the book to Rudy, and I sent him a note telling him to play the tune when he received the book. But I believe that spiteful Gertrude must have played me false and never taken the book because I have been here alone for fifty years, waiting for my Rudy, and he has never come. Oh, Rudy, where can you be? It's been so long. Fifty years, said Mark. Reckoning that must make her nearly seventy. I must say, you don't look it. Of course, I do not. For me, I make that time does not touch me. But tell me, how did you know the tune that works the spell? It was taught me by my dear Rudy. I'm not sure where I picked it up, said Mark. For all I know, maybe it was in the top ten. I'll have to ask my music teacher. He's sure to know. Perhaps he'll have heard of your Rudolph. Privately, Mark feared that Rudolph might very well be dead by now, but he did not like to depress Princess Sophia Maria Luisa. So he bade her a polite good night and promised to come back as soon as he could. That's the next part three in a minute.